thought, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, it, and this, this happened like all day. I'm just wrecked. I'm like, I don't even know what to do. I'm, so, uh, so we'll read, we'll read some scripture together. How about that? And um, then we'll go from there. This is from uh, Romans chapter eight, verses one through seventeen. And and let me just share the first verse, and then and then just a a little uh, explanation to catch us up with where we are in Romans. Uh, so now, uh, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Okay. So why does it say so now? Well, it's what came before, of course. And what came before was the, the expl- explication that Paul is given by God, inspired by God, to deliver to us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of what he has done for us, there is no condemnation. We are safe from the judgment of God. We are standing before God as though we had never, ever sinned. Not even once, not in the slightest way. We are safe in Christ Jesus, right? And so because of all of that, Right? And you may even want to go back and review all of that in Romans. Because of all that, there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you've not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. And I love it if we could pray together and uh, we'll pray before we dig into the scriptures here. Let's join together. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your word because we believe, as your word says, that, that, that the scriptures are, are God-breathed. That, Lord, you inspired this word through the apostle Paul. You have, you have revealed yourself. You've revealed truth. You've revealed life through the apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And, Lord, we believe We believe that your word is alive and active as your own word testifies. Lord, so we pray that you would speak to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, giving us, Lord, understanding, but also application and the faith to live it out. Lord, we don't want to just be hearers of your word. We want to be doers, building our lives on the rock who is Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Uh, so we're, we're continuing in our series from the book of Romans called Transformed by Love. And, and, and it's really just all about uh, our lives being changed in Christ Jesus. And we started off by talking about how really for the Christian, life change, life transformation has to be, has to be founded, it has to be grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's not about what we do. It's not about our accomplishments. It's about what Christ has done and is doing and will do. But also, just simply because if we're going to allow God to do what he wants in our lives, if we're going to give him our lives to shape and to mold, to really change us, then we're going to have to trust him. And what we see in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And as the scriptures tell us, that actually proves God's love. And because he loves us like that, we know that we can trust him. Because someone who loves us like that, he must have only good in mind for our lives. And so we put our trust in him to do what he wants to do in our lives. And that's really, that's where we're going to kind of pick up today. As we're talking about the life change for the Christian, we're going to pick up there by by looking at uh, what God wants. In other words, what is God's heart for us? Because there, there are these two dynamics And when it comes to life change for the Christian, there are these two dynamics that can actually derail the life change God wants to do in us uh, almost from the very start. Uh, So let's talk just quickly about those two dynamics, Um, these dynamics that that can derail us if we don't understand God's heart for us. So dynamic one is um, this, well, let's just call it despair. Despair. Despair over failure. And so this is how it goes. Uh, God shows us in his word. God speaks to us by his spirit and says, you know what, Jeremy, this doesn't belong in your life. Th- this attitude, this, this action, this thing you're doing, this way you're thinking, th- this, this does not belong in your life. And so, you know, we say, okay, Lord, I, I hear you and I trust you. And so um, that's what I want to. I want this out of my life, Right. And so we start out that way and maybe even things are going along really well and we're seeing this life change and we're feeling more freedom in our lives. But then, but then, see, we fall back into that same old habit sometimes. And then we start to wonder, you know, um, (laughs) is there like, is there like a maximum number of um, stumbles that I'm allotted? Like, is that a thing? You know, is God going to get to some point where he says, you know what, Um, we've been, we've been working on this and and I'm kind of, kind of tired of hearing about this. I'm tired of seeing you, is that a thing, right? And and we can actually despair, we can despair over our failures. Got to understand God's heart for us. The second dynamic that can derail our life change is really just underestimating how hard this stuff is. And we sort of assume that this this would just be an, an easy thing, right? God just says it and I do it and then it's done, right? This is difficult stuff to actually if we really want to be controlled by the spirit of God and not by our sinful nature. See, the, the word that's translated there is actually just flesh. In, in the Greek, it's just flesh. But what, what, what that means, though, in, and I think this is a good definition of sinful nature of the flesh, as the Bible talks about it, it, quite simply, it means disordered desires. That we would be controlled by disordered desires. And what we know about disordered desires are really two things, right? Well, one, they're disordered. Okay, I know that sounds really brilliant, right? But because they're disordered, they're they're actually harmful. They actually cause destruction and damage. They damage our lives, our faith. They damage the people around us. And, and, And so they're disordered, they're destructive. But what we also know about them is that they're desires. If we could just be real honest about that, that there are things that we actually really want to do that are a part of our sinful nature. They are a disordered desire, but we want to do them nonetheless. We want to do it, we want to think it. We, let's just be honest about this. And, and so wh- wh- why is it actually, why is it that we would tell ourselves no? Because it's disordered, yeah, but it's a desire. And so these two dynamics actually can, can derail us before we even really get started. And, and I'll tell you, as I was praying through this sermon this week, um, I, I, I started thinking about, um, about our, our girls, right? And I started thinking about our heart for them. Like, what, what is it that we actually want for them? And, uh, and, and I think God opened some stuff up for me. And, and, and we're talking about, like, with our girls, our discussions, our teaching, our, our time, our discipline, all that stuff, right? What is it? What's the goal? What's our heart for them? What do we actually want? 
And I can tell you, I, I can tell you, um, and I know lots of you all are parents, and you've been parents way longer than I have, but, um, but what I've discovered after almost 17 years of parenting is that there has never been a day when I have followed our kids around watching for them to do something wrong because I'm really into the punishment thing. Right? That's not a thing. Like if that's, if you're thinking, yeah, I kind of do that, then we need to talk because that's messed up. Like that is messed up. But, but think about how much we, when we think about God, how he looks at us, how often do we make that sort of assumption? The guy's just watching and he's following me around and he's, he's waiting for me to mess up because he's really looking to zap me, right? How often do we think about God like that? But Listen, that's not our heart. And I'll tell you also, after almost 17 years of parenting, that there's never been a time when our, our girls have messed up. And, and let me just qualify this by saying this very infrequent, very infrequent indeed. Um, but there's never been a time when I said, okay, that's it. We're done. This, this relationship thing, it's over. All right, you messed up. Bye. Right, there's, there's never been a time why? Because that's not our heart for them. When I think about our heart for our girls, and I know we're not unique in this, but we really want them to have, have lives where they thrive. We want them to thrive because they love God with everything that they have, everything that they are. We want them to thrive because they love people like they love themselves. And we want them to thrive. And that, listen, Jesus talks about this. If, if, if I think that way, and I understand that, and I am a sinful, broken man, I don't know if that disappoints you to hear that this morning, but it is true. And if I feel that way about our kids, then how is it that God feels about us, right? And so let's think about these two dynamics. First of all, let's think about this failure dynamic, this despair over failure. When we see in the scriptures that God's heart for us is that we would have no fear of condemnation. That's the only reason that he would reassure us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For those who belong to Jesus, no condemnation. He, his heart for us is that we would not be afraid of condemnation. In fact, he goes so far as to say that God doesn't give us a spirit of a fearful slave. Well, let's think about that for a minute. A slave is about a function, right? About performance. The slave performs or there's trouble. Right? Isn't that how it goes with a slave? That they are about a function, and if they don't do the function, then it's big trouble. And so often we look at God that way, and that's not, by God's word, how he looks at us. He says that by the grace of Jesus, he has adopted us as his children. Our relationship with God, not dependent on our performance, but upon his love. Right? And so he says... Listen, you are not a fearful slave. Jesus was condemned in your place so that you can live. There's no condemnation in him. Now, let's think then about this second dynamic that can derail the change that God wants to make in our lives. And that is that we face very real temptations. I know that we don't like to talk about this, but we actually want to do sin, <laughs> right? We pray, lead us not into temptation, not because God does that, because we want God to lead us somewhere else. It is a real thing. We really feel temptation. And what we must understand is we are struggling with sin is that God has only the very best in mind in how he leads our lives. This is what the scripture says, that his goal for our lives is life and peace. Letting the spirit control your mind, the scripture says, leads to life and peace. You see, Jesus, the scripture tells us, comes and lives in our hearts, dwells in our hearts by faith. And it is his desire to make a change in our lives so that why? So that what? He says in John 10 that he wants us to have a full, rich, abundant life, life that is satisfying. He wants that. He tells us also in the gospel of John that he wants us to have his joy and he wants to make our joy complete. He tells us to come to, us to, come to him because he wants to give rest to our souls. He wants us to have what is really Life And so when we face temptation, we can know that sin is going to lead, is going to lead further and further toward death. But Jesus is going to bring us more and more to life. And, and so then let's, let's get, let's get really practical. Um, how is it that this life change is actually enacted? What's the mechanism? What's the means by which God uses to actually change our lives? And the way that I would say this is that it is, it is a holiness 
that God works in our lives through relationship. It is holiness through relationship. There, there's this guy, um, Nabil Qureshi, and he right now, right now is, is dwelling in the presence of Christ. He passed away uh, a, a few months ago, and, and I want to tell you just a little bit of his story. Nabil um, was born into a, a, a very devout Muslim family, and, and he lived the, the early part of his life that way. He started his education, and uh, by the providence of God, God put this really just, just strong Christian man uh, in, his, in his path, and they became good friends. In the course of their friendship, they actually began exploring their faith, right? Uh, he started digging into his faith, Nabil did, and he started digging into the Christian faith. And, and I'm really pleased to report to you this morning that uh, God actually is faithful to his promises, right? Did anybody know that this morning? That God actually tells us, he says, like, hey, I'm going to do this. If you do this, I'll do that, right? He makes these promises. And did you know that he actually, like, does what he says, right? Like, that's a pretty cool thing. And so what God says is that if you will seek me with all of your heart, he says, I'll, I'll actually, I'll be found by you. you. You'll find me. And that's what happened in Nabil's life. He starts digging into the Christian faith, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God gives him confirmation of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Nabil gives his life to Jesus. And this guy has such, such an intellect that God has blessed him with that, um, that actually he begins... Um, he begins to, to be a part of these public debates, right? He, he has these public debates with, uh, with Muslim scholars. And, and I want to tell you just a quick story. Um, this is going somewhere, I promise. I want to tell you a quick story that came out of one of those debates. So they, they finish up the debate. And uh, as, as you can imagine, lots of people leave right after the debate. But a few hang around and they come and ask personal questions and so forth. So there's this, this clearly Muslim family that stays after. So a mom and, and two kids. And uh, the mom kind of hangs back at a distance, but the kids come right up to him, and, and they, they ask him this question. They say, um, if Christians are saved by grace and not by what they do, doesn't that mean that Christians will lead immoral lives? It's a good question, right? Really good question. And I love the way he answers it. So he asks him, first, first question, he says, so is, is that your mom over there? And they say, yes, that's our mom, right? And then he asks him, he says, um, do, you, do you love her? And they say, well, of course, that's our mom, right? Who doesn't love their mom? We love her. Right? And he says, and this, I love this question because this question just opens up the gospel, right? He says to him, now, do you think that your mom would rather you listen to her because you're afraid of her? or because you love her? What do you think? Would she rather you listen to her because you're, you're scared of her or because you love her? And then he was able to tell them, you know, we love Jesus because he first loved us. And we obey Jesus because we love him, because we want to please him, because he has our hearts, right? And he's able to open the gospel to them. This is holiness through relationship. Listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a license to fulfill, to gratify the desires of our sinful nature. It's not. That is not what the gospel is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about the fullness of salvation. It is how God restores people to himself. And in that restored relationship, it is how he transforms people's lives, restoring us to the glory of God. I, I love the way Charles Spurgeon puts this. Real simple. He says, he says holiness is the visible part of salvation, right? Like you, you can't see eternal life right now. You can't see that. You can't see the change in this relationship. But he says holiness is the visible part of salvation. And you know, I, I, was, I, I was thinking about it this way. You know, in Jesus' day, when, when, um, when he said to people, come and follow me, in Jesus' day, they would have they understood more clearly and more readily what he was actually meaning by that, right? Why? Because Jesus, along with being the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God, he was a rabbi, right? He was a teacher. And what they would know is that rabbis would have students, they'd have disciples, and those disciples would spend lots and lots of time because they would watch how the rabbi lived, and they would emulate the rabbi, and the rabbi would teach them and would, would rebuke and correct them and would mentor them, right? This is, this is what 
what they knew, right, of rabbis. And so this rabbi Jesus comes and says, follow me. And what they know is this. If I do this, I'm going to place myself under his leadership, under his authority. We're going to spend a lot of time together. And I'm going to seek to emulate who he is. And he's going to teach me. And he's going to correct me. And he's going to lead me in the way that I should go because he's my rabbi, right? Today, though, I think it's a little harder for us to understand that. A little harder for us to get that picture. Why? Because Jesus isn't physically present with us, but he actually is with us in a far more powerful way. In fact, Jesus says when he is ascending into heaven, this is actually a good thing because the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. And and it is Christ dwelling in us who actually changes our lives. It's what God always intended. Listen to our scripture. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives in you. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus leads our lives. How does that happen? The spirit leads us and guides us, especially and primarily the spirit leads us by the scriptures, by the word of God. Jesus says the spirit's going to lead you into all truth. He's going to remind you of the things that I've said to you. He He makes this word alive in us. Get this, right? Get this. You could, and I could, every day get into this book, into the scriptures, and we can know what it is to have Jesus, the King of Kings, speak to us. I mean, are you kidding? Like, why would we not do that all the time? I don't don't know. Like, literally, he would speak a word of comfort to you, He would speak a word of correction. He would speak a word that's going to lead you more and more fully into life. He's going to show you that next faithful step for your life, right? It it amazes me. I don't know why. It amazes me every time I hear from Jesus from the scriptures. But we follow Jesus today no less than his original followers. Does Does that make some sense? This is holiness through relationship. Christ dwelling in us. Christ transforming our lives. God said he was going to do it. Did you know that? All the way back in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, God said, this is, this is where this is headed. This is God's heart for us. It was never that God said, you know what? I want you to be really afraid of me and do what I say. That's the kind of relationship I'd like to have with you. When it, God never said that. God said, I want a people after my own heart. I want a people who are my people. I want a people set apart and holy to me. And this is how he said it would come about. This is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. But this is the new covenant, the new relationship I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Friends, we, if we are in Christ, we have the handwriting of Jesus on our hearts, leading our lives, leading us more and more fully into what is everlasting life. And so what we have really is a decision before us. And I believe it's not really a small thing because the decision before us is really, you know, do I want to belong to Christ? And if I belong to Christ, then of course that means I don't belong to myself anymore. I'm not my own, I'm his. Do I want that? Do I want my life to be about pleasing him and not myself? Is, is that something I really want? Do I want to be preoccupied with pleasing him, with glorifying him? Is that really a thing that I want? Do I really want him to change me from the inside out? Do I want him to write on my heart the desires of God, the character of God, the will and the purposes of God? Do I actually want him to change my attitudes, my thoughts, my inclinations, my intentions? Do I actually want him to change my life? It's not a small thing. Because it's really, it's, in a real way, it's death. It is to die. It is the death that leads to life. Because what I know is that if I'm going to take hold of this new life that Christ has for me, I'm going to have to let go of the old. I'm going to have to let go of the life where, where I live for myself, where I live for the gratifications of my sinful desire, my disordered desires. I'm going to have to let go of that life if I'm going to reach forward and take hold of the new life that Christ has for me. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. The Holy Spirit will give us the strength to do one of the hardest things in the whole world to do, and that is to tell ourselves no. (laughs) 
you think, <laughs> man, I'm telling you, people think maybe that like telling kids is, is, is hard, telling them no. I'm telling you, the hardest thing in the whole world is to tell ourselves no. And, and the Holy Spirit actually gives us the power to do that. We can actually say no to our disordered de desires, to things like, like envy and lust and gossip and greed and self-righteousness and selfishness and addiction and bitter anger and pride and so on. We can actually live lives that more and more are pleasing to God, more and more honor God. We can actually do it, but we must not think that this is easy. That doesn't do us any good to think this is an easy thing. Because, it's, listen, it's not. We wouldn't need God's help if it was easy. We would have already done it, right? We would have done it on ourselves, by ourselves. It's not easy, but I will tell you also that it is worth it. It is worth it because Jesus is worth it. And because the more we put to death the sinful deeds of our sinful nature, the more we put that nature to death, the more we can take hold of Christ and the new life that we have in him. The more we put that to death, the more we can have of Christ in our lives. It is not easy, but I will tell you that it is worth it. And I want to call us to make a decision this morning to decide, I will not allow sin to take root and grow and live in my life. I will not allow it. I will bring it before the throne of Jesus and I will say, Jesus, I want you to crucify this one too. This one too. I will not let sin occupy my thoughts. I will take those thoughts captive and I will choose to think on those things that will be pleasing to the Holy Spirit. I will ask for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you search me and know me? Would you show me? Is there any way in me? Is there anything in me that offends you? Would you show it to me? And would you help me root it out of my life? Because I want more of you, God. And I will take hold of every tool, of every weapon, of every power that God puts at my disposal. I will seek God in the scriptures. I will seek him in prayer. I will seek him in the fellowship of believers. I will, I will confess my sins to a trusted brother. I will confess my sins to a trusted sister. And I will ask for their prayers so that I can be healed. I will avail myself of every weapon he has given me against the darkness in my life. And I will not become discouraged. Because I know that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I will not become discouraged because I know that I am not just a slave. That my relationship with God is not dependent on my getting it right. It's dependent on Jesus getting it right. It's dependent on His love for me. And so I will not be discouraged. I will know that I am a child of God. I will know that it is the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead who lives in me. I will know that the one that I've entrusted my life to that he is faithful and he will take what I've entrusted to him and he will carry it on to completion to the glory of Christ Jesus our Lord. And maybe, maybe I could get an amen right now. Yeah, praise God. And so, if you would, let's, let's pray for each other. This stuff is not easy. It is not easy, but he is, he, he is so worth it. Let's pray for each other. Lord, we, we want to say to you um, what you already know that we are broken, that we are sinners, and we are desperately in need of a Savior, as much today as any day. But Lord, you, you know our hearts, and you know that along with all of those busted up, disordered desires, there is within us a desire for you and you alone. And so, Lord, would you fuel that desire by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you put sin to death in us? Would you kill those desires? Would you make us holy because you are holy and may it all be to your glory as you bring us more and more alive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.